I would like to tell a story that is about passion and discovery. More specifically, I want to talk about space exploration. In the last years, I was part of a mission that landed on and explored an asteroid called Ryugu. Our lander was called Mascot and traveled through the solar system for four years on board its Japanese mothership called Hayabusa 2. We explored an exciting small world that no human had ever seen before. I would like to share this experience with you to give you an idea of how such missions are even possible and what we have to do in order to reach these remote and alien worlds. But first of all, why do we do this? Why do people spend a decade of their lives working on a mission to explore a space rock? That is because it is in the nature of humans to explore and expand their reach and their knowledge. Just as we haven't stopped until we mapped out all the continents on our planet, we wish to explore further and go beyond Earth. The other planets are just as fascinating as our own, but there is even more out there. There are comets, many types of asteroids, moons with volcanoes and others with icy surfaces and oceans underneath. But what is specifically interesting about small asteroids is that by visiting them, we are not just traveling in space, but also in time. The reason we explore those specific objects is that they give us a glimpse of what the solar system looked like billions of years ago, before the planets, as we know them, even formed. By visiting these objects, we are going back in time by four billion years. This enables us to understand how the planets formed and what created the conditions that we experience on Earth today. How did the solar system go from initially being a cloud of gas to forming a small number of large planets? How did water come to Earth? The story of the solar system is also part of the story of us as humans, because these are the processes that make our existence possible in the first place. In this talk, I would like to relive the exploration of asteroid Rugu together with you. This was a journey into the unknown, and our team spent nine years preparing for this mission. Our biggest challenge was that we had very little knowledge of what our destination would be like. We went from knowing nothing about this object to having a very detailed understanding, and I am now going to tell you how we did it. How do we get to these remote objects in the first place? One interesting thing about moving in space is that distance is not as important as you might think. The Earth is currently moving through the solar system at 30 kilometers per second and thereby travels huge distances at any moment. What is important is to match your speed to the object that you want to explore. As you can see in the picture, depending on the distance to the Sun, every object has a different speed. For example, the Earth moves three times as fast as Saturn. After launching from Earth, the challenge is to either speed up or slow down by many times the speed of a fighter jet in order to move just as fast as your target. And once you have a certain speed in space, you will keep moving indefinitely because there is nothing to slow you down. Now, what can we do to change our speed? The special thing about moving in space is that unlike on the ground, there is no matter to push against. When driving a bicycle, you push the ground underneath you to the back in order to move yourself forward. A ship accelerates the water that surrounds it, and a plane does so with the air of our atmosphere. But in space, there is no matter to accelerate, and every spacecraft has to bring this matter with it as fuel. The rocket motor accelerates this fuel to very high speeds and expels it to the back in order to drive the spacecraft forward. Think about throwing a ball while standing on a skateboard. Throwing the ball in one direction will move you into the other direction. Our mothership, Hayabusa 2, used an iron engine for this purpose. This is a type of engine where no combustion takes place. The fuel is accelerated through an electric field and can achieve much higher speeds compared to a rocket engine. But there is another source of energy that one can use to efficiently move around in the solar system, namely the gravity of other planets. 
Spacecraft do swing-by maneuvers by flying close to planets and thereby performing a gravitational slingshot. This way, some energy of motion is transferred from the planet to the spacecraft. In our case, Hayabusa 2 circled the Sun once and then approached the Earth again and used its gravity to accelerate towards its destination. In this process, a tiny bit of energy was taken away from our planet and transferred to the spacecraft, and the speed at which the Earth moves around the Sun has decreased ever so slightly due to this maneuver. Now that we know how to move around, how do we plan our trip to get to our destination? On Earth, we have maps on which you can always see where you are relative to your target. But navigating in space is more complicated because both you and your destination are moving constantly. As you can see in the picture, it is not sufficient to simply move in the direction of your destination because it will be gone by the time you reach the place you aim for. Instead, you have to calculate where your target will be in the future and aim for this position in order to meet it. So instead of having just a map that shows the location of objects, we also use their speeds to predict all future positions in order to find a path to reach them. Another interesting fact about interplanetary travel is that it is difficult to know where you are and how fast you are moving. When driving a car, you can always look at your speedometer or use GPS to locate yourself on the map. But in space, there is no reference. We determine the position and speed by using huge antennas on Earth that track the radio signal from the spacecraft. Just as the sound of an ambulance becomes more high-pitched as it approaches you, the frequency of the spacecraft's radio waves changes with its speed, and our antennas can detect this from Earth. Because the spacecraft are so far away, the signals are very faint, and the antennas have to be extremely big, like these ones. It took Hayabusa 2 four years to travel to the asteroid. In all this time, we were curious about what our destination would be like. Even our largest telescopes cannot resolve such a tiny object. To give you a sense of scale, the asteroid that we were aiming for had a diameter of only 900 meters and was millions of kilometers away. That's like looking at this carpet on the surface of the moon. Even our most sensitive telescopes can only see Ryugu as a single bright dot. However, it was important to know what our destination would be like in order to plan for the operations. I needed to know the value of the gravitational force, which is a function of its size. How could we estimate the size of Ryugu before getting there? It is not simply the case that objects that appear brighter are also bigger. This is because we don't know how reflective the surface is, so a small, highly reflective asteroid will look the same as a large dark one. We therefore look at the object in the infrared, which is the thermal emission of the body, and compare this with the brightness in the visible light. This way, our scientists inferred a diameter for Ryugu of about 900 meters. We also wanted to know the shape to find a safe landing site. Basic shapes can be deduced from Earth even if the object is too small to see its form in a telescope. This is done by observing how its brightness changes over time. As the asteroid rotates, the light it reflects changes depending on its shape and rotation speed. With this data, we can use algorithms to find a shape that matches the brightness signal. And for Ryugu, the predictions look like this. In the summer of 2018, Hayabusa 2 was in the last phase of the approach and could finally image Ryugu for the first time. Although there is not much to see yet, we as a team got very excited because we knew that our lander was so close to its destination that soon we would receive the first images ever of our target asteroid. We watched as the bright spot grew and become more and more detailed over the next few weeks. And in July of 2018, Hayabusa 2 finally arrived at the asteroid, and this is what it looked like. Over the next few months, Hayabusa 2 would hover at a safe distance, and we would have some time to prepare for the descent to the surface. Let me give you a short introduction to our lander mascot. 
It was a 10-kilogram lander containing four instruments to perform a wide range of scientific analysis. There was a camera, a microscope, a radiometer, which senses the heat emitted by the surface, and a sensor to measure the magnetic field. Because of its small size of 30 by 30 by 20 centimeters and the severe mass constraints, there were no solar panels, and we had to use a battery that limited the mission time to 17 hours. The mission had to be highly optimized to make the most out of this short period of time, gather as much scientific data as possible, and transmit it to the mother spacecraft. We also had a locomotion mechanism on board, and this was my domain. Moving around on small bodies requires a different approach as opposed to moving on large planets. Because the gravity is 60,000 times smaller than on Earth, it is not possible to move by using wheels or chains. This type of locomotion is only possible if you have a force that presses you to the ground so that you can use friction to move forward. Also, the ground could have been anything from rock solid to fluffy and soft. So the idea was to use a completely internal mechanism in which we accelerate and decelerate an arm with a mass on its tip. This way, we can rotate Mascot into the correct orientation for the instruments and also move around on the surface. The challenging thing in designing this system is that it is not possible to test it on Earth, because here, the gravity is so strong that the lander simply doesn't move. The system had to be designed by relying completely on our physical models and simulations. And keep in mind that all the systems were developed without having any idea of what Ryugu actually looked like. So just before landing, I had to use the actual measured value of the gravitational force and adjust all control parameters to make sure the lander would move just right. One more thing we had to do as a team was to find a landing site. Many aspects had to be taken into account, and different engineers and scientists had different and often opposing ideas of where to land. The place shouldn't be too hot or the lander might overheat. There shouldn't be any big boulders in the region that might make it difficult to communicate. On the other hand, some scientists wanted to measure the properties of these boulders. We finally found a compromise between safety concerns and scientific arguments, and with all parameters set, we performed the very last software upload and were ready for separation. On October 3rd of 2018, Hayabusa 2 descended down to 50 meters above the surface and activated the separation mechanism. Mascot was pushed out of its container by a set of springs and started flying towards the surface. This is an actual image taken by the navigation camera just a few seconds after separation. But this is not what you see in the control room. Keep in mind that all this takes place very far away and that the rate of data transmission is much too low to transmit images in real time. What we were actually looking at were the sensor readings. When the value of the magnetic field dropped dramatically, we knew that we had successfully left the mother spacecraft and that our mission had started. In the control room, we could see that Mascot had detected the surface and therefore successfully landed. Since the lander was designed to operate completely automatically, we expected to just monitor what would happen. We cheered as the first data came in, but then we noticed that something wasn't quite right. It turned out that the lander had detected the wrong orientation. The surface was very rough and much darker than expected, and it was difficult for Mascot to see which side was facing up. Meanwhile, our battery was depleting, and we knew that we had to take action or we would lose our mission. Our operations team had to figure out a way to interrupt and reset the lander while making sure the command would not damage the system. It was clear that we would only have one shot of getting this right. When the sun rose on the second asteroid day, the command was sent. But we had to wait 40 minutes for the signal to travel to the asteroid and back. You can imagine the tension in a room filled with people who have dedicated many years of their lives to this project and who are crossing their fingers, hoping it would work out. And in the end, it did. The mobility system turned the lander to the correct side and we were able to perform the full range of scientific experiments. We experienced three asteroid days during the 17 hours of operation and were able to recover all the data, including a lot of pictures from our camera. 
We set out on our journey knowing that the environment could be anything. But despite this uncertainty, we were able to design our system to work efficiently. The mobility concept that we were not able to test on Earth worked on its first try. Even by only simulating how the lander would behave in the extremely low gravity of Ryugu, we were able to learn how to control its motion. All the systems on Mascot worked together and enabled us to explore the surface of asteroid Ryugu, which was a complete mystery even just a few months ago. By characterizing the stones and boulders on the surface, our scientists can infer how Ryugu and other small asteroids evolved over time. Most of these objects collided long ago and eventually became parts of planets such as our own. With this mission, we have added new pieces to the puzzle that is the quest to understand why the solar system looks the way it does today. Thank you. <laughs>